Welcome back. Today's video, we're going to talk about how to actually run a baseball game as a coach. In the last three videos, we saw how to pick a team, how to run your team meeting, how to run practices. Today, we get game day, we put it all together. So if you've been enjoying the last three videos and adding this fourth one, and you would like a copy of this coaching youth baseball or softball diagram, it'll be linked below. But please subscribe to my channel because I will have a lot more information about coaching, about hitting, about playing the game, and about the tools we use to enjoy the game better, to perform better. So let's get into it. Today, we're going to figure out how do we assign positions, how we create a batting order, and how we coach the bases, getting our kids around to score. And then an important factor is the after game ritual. When you get your team together and you've been practicing, you start having some ideas as to how good each individual player is in different positions. Hopefully in practices, you've been playing them all over the place. So you get a feel, plus they don't feel like you're pigeonholing them. Now, depending on your philosophy, which we talked about in video two, that it would depend on how you're going to position your fielders. If you're a win at all cost guy, then obviously your best players are gonna go to shortstop. At, well, pitcher, catcher, shortstop, first base, and then you're gonna fill in the rest of the team. But if you're a guy that helps, a guy, a gal, that helps people develop their skills, and if you're playing in a league where it's not, the league standings don't count until the playoffs, then there really is no reason to leave a kid in what we used to call right field. Um, because what's the harm? Uh, if the difference between winning all the games and winning half the games only does something different in the seeding, and you still have to win all the games to win a championship in the tournament, then let's let the kids play and grow naturally. You don't have to play them there all the time, of course, and you don't want them to get hurt, but an inning here or an inning there just makes them and their parents feel so much better. Overall, you want kids in the infield that have hands that can feel the ball. They're not going to take a bounce into, the, into their noggin. And in the outfield, depending on what age group you're working with, it's really just kind of a throwaway position at the beginning because so few kids can hit it into the outfield. But as they get older, then we need to catch the ball. When you think about it, outfield is your last defense on those three and four bases that they can get if it gets past them. So teaching them how to knock the ball down, keep it in front of them, all of these are things that you wanna be doing in practice and then you wanna be positioning them uh, so that you have people that can stop those balls from going past them in the outfield someone that can pay attention. Sometimes I took my most ADHD kid and put him at catcher because that's where he's got to concentrate every play. So it may seem counterintuitive, but actually I've had some real good success uh, moving them that direction. First base is another place you have to pay attention. You know, the attention span is part of the factoring in of position play. But 
rotating kids around. There's nothing really harmful in that. Uh, a good exercise. As you get to playoffs, you may tell your parents, we're going to play people a little bit more than others. There are rules that say you have to play so many innings in a game, and that's great, but those kids also, they know, uh, for the most part, when <clears throat> they're getting shunned. So uh, nobody likes to feel that. So try and develop self-esteem, help them, and choose positions accordingly. Next, you've got to come up with a batting order. I devoted a whole video to creating a batting order, so you may just want to um, look up above. I should have it uh, scrolling there somewhere. Again, if nothing's on at stake, rotating kids to the top and the bottom and so forth, but generally you have your fastest kid on the team or the one that can get on base a lot goes lead off. Somebody that can move them over a lot of times is second. Uh, sometimes you just go top to bottom. You earn your spot because you have the best hitting and you just run one through 9, 10, 11, 12, how many you have. There's a lot of different ways. Again, like I said, I have a whole video devoted to that. Any way you do it, just try and get your kids, encourage them to use their at bat to keep the train moving. In other words, get on base. Don't worry too much about trying to do too much. Just as long as you don't get out, the train keeps moving, you'll score runs. So then it comes down to coaching the bases, getting your kids to go around. Hopefully they're looking for ways to get to the next base. The goal of baseball, softball, to score more runs than the other team. To score more runs, you have to get farther along the base paths to get home. So any chance they can do to take a reasonable risk, risk reward where you don't get out, getting that extra base either on their hits, is if you have stealing in your league, something to look for. Um, but as you have coaches at the bases, whether you're the coach, whether you assign it, you want to have someone at third base that really understands all the nuances of the game, understands the kids, their speed, actually figuring out who's coming up in the order next. If you've got pretty much a sure out, you may take more risks. If you have a slugger coming up, you may not take as many risks of moving them through third base. So a rule that we used to play by is you don't want to make your first out or your third out at third base because from second base, normally a base hit can score the person. The risk reward isn't as great over at third base as it is getting to second base, say with no outs or with two outs, getting to second versus being at first can be the difference between one hit or two hits needed to get that run in. First base, generally, you just, it could almost be one of your kids that are really alert. You just really want to let the base runner know two things. One, where's the ball? And two, pick up your third base coach. So that before they get to second base, unless it's a slide play or a just that's the only base they can go to, you want them looking to third to see what that coach is telling them either to come on or hold there. At first base, you want them where the ball is so that they can kind of make their own decision as to whether to go or stay, or also just good information on how they wouldn't get picked off or have the hidden ball trick, knowing where the ball is, and then reminding them to pick up the third base coach. One of my favorite topics about coaching baseball is the after game ritual. And why would that be? I've been coaching 50 years, I still play. But unfortunately, the thing the kids remember 
is what happens after the game. The camaraderie, getting sodas or something in the snack bar. It's unbelievable how much little after we've poured all of our investment into these kids to know these fundamentals that the thing that they remember most is the game after events, the swim party after the league is over or pizza party or, or whatever you have, awards banquet, whatever it is, uh, those are the more memorable things. And when we think about it, we really are providing a full experience, not just a, you know, trying to build professional ball players. How few of us have had the luxury or the giftedness of having that athlete that does go on and play, even in high school, let alone college and pros. So let's make sure that we keep the focus on the overall thing, having fun. When I was in college, I had a professor that taught that there was three events that happened for every one event that you actually thought about. We think about we're playing the game, but there's actually to really maximize the full experience there is the anticipation, putting on your uniform, getting ready, getting ready for practice, doing those things. The event, of course, is playing the games, but then the other, he used a big college $5 word, uh, recapitulation, where we recap and we just go over. If you think about the times I get together now, we play a couple of games during the week, and almost always we go out afterwards for lunch. And then we're just talking, we're ragging on one another. Those are the fun times that we have saying how great we played, how bonehead somebody else played. Now we don't want to encourage that in young kids, but I'm just saying that's what we are as adults, uh, as older adults. For kids, they did a survey of 27 year olds and they said, what do you remember about your little league experience? And the number one thing that they remembered was the Cokes after the game. Now I'm not endorsing one product over another, but that is the absolute wording that they use as to what they remembered. So make sure you develop fun within some kind of after game ritual, after season ritual. And we will talk to you next time.